got had to pull out some extra chairs. So that's pretty cool. Um, welcome everybody on Zoom. Uh, Dana, you're going to have to click the slides so you can't walk away. <laughs> um, so this is the the May 2023 indoor meeting for the Raleigh Astronomy Club. Welcome everyone who new uh, and I don't want to say old uh, uh, previously existing members. <laughs> Um, so while we have the presentation, this is going to be a little bit different, I think, than, than typical. So I'm also doing the presentation tonight and I want it to be interactive. So if you have questions or comments, I'll have a microphone, bring it around. Um, if you're on Zoom, um, if you have something you want to put in chat, or probably we can do a moment to ask if anybody would like to unmute, that'd be fine. Um, we did have one specific thing that some of the leadership were curious about, uh, some new members, anybody new, kind of wanted to understand, like, if you're willing to speak, not going to try and put anybody on the spot, but how did you find out about the club and what, what uh, drove you to decide to join? I have a microphone. So... I got interested uh, in doing astronomy about a month ago, and I figured Raleigh must have an astronomy club. So I Googled Raleigh Astronomy Club, Nailed which, it. <laughs> yeah, which took me to the website. And the reason I joined the club is because when I've had other hobbies, one of the best things you can do is join the club. That's the way to meet people and get support. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else or anybody on, on Zoom? No. Okay. Next. Um, okay, so we have, oh, oh okay. <laughs> All right, one moment. I probably could have popped over to my window. What does it say? Yeah, well. Um, so we have Kelly on Zoom. I have a telescope I haven't used yet. I am overwhelmed, so I thought I'd find others for help and learning. Wonderful. Good segue, too, into upcoming events, which we can talk, we'll talk about more in the, the business meeting as well. Um, the outreach events we have are a good opportunity for astronomy club members or the public to bring out the air, ask questions, learn about what you have or learn about equipment that other people have, if you're interested in, in buying something. So we have next week on Wednesday, the Willard, which is in downtown Raleigh. Dana, next. Um, our next indoor meeting is coming fast in two weeks because we, we have the indoor meeting uh, when there's a new moon and it's not a 30-ish day cycle. So we have to flip it uh, every once in a while. And we have the imaging meeting the week after on the 15th. Uh, Raleigh uh, Astronomy Club observing session on the 13th. Hopefully we'll get a clear night for a change. Uh, and then again, the Willard uh, for June on the 28th. And I think that might be it. Um, after the meeting, uh, several members of the, the club or public, if, if you're not a member, we go to Sammy's uh, Tap and Grill, which is near uh, here. Um, so if you're interested in joining, talking, having dessert, having a drink, eating dinner, or not, not uh, eating, but you just join us and chit chat, it'd be great. Uh, next. All right. <laughs> so this is the weird part where I introduce myself. Um, so I am uh, one of the co-chairs of the Raleigh Astronomy Club. I've been a member of the club for about two years, a little over two years now. And I got interested at the conjunction of um, Jupiter and Saturn back in 2020, I believe, December 2020. My kids got a Dobsonian eight inch Dob, which I still use. And uh, I looked through it and was like, I want pictures of stuff in space. So that was me. That's my, my entry into uh, astronomy was, was through astrophotography. Yes, Frank. Uh, at that Jupiter Saturn, which was in December of 2020, 
I did an observation at a First Presbyterian Church in High Point and also uh, received an award from the Astronomical League on that event. Oh. And there were a few other scopes there, too. Oh, very and were cool. also singing, the choir was singing unique music outside, which added to the festive heavens declare the glory of God atmosphere. All right. Thanks for sharing, Frank. Okay, Dana, I am going to share my screen now. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm here, right? And there's a, there is a presenter cam, so hopefully people can see. <laughs> All right, there we go. My pretty drab introduction slide. So quick, quick history on this slide deck. So I, I've enjoyed taking pictures of nebula and especially like dark nebula, so dusty stuff. Um, and I put together a slide deck and be like, okay, what are the different types of nebula? What is the, the origin of the words that are in astronomy? And it's grown from that to include galaxies to solar system objects. And I'm sure I'll add more as I take more pictures of things. Uh, it's kind of what I'm limited by. I did add, uh, Doug Lively in the back here, did allow me to include one picture that we'll, we'll see in a bit, which is... Uh, something I have not been able to do yet. It's, it's really cool. Um, so that's kind of where this started. And then I've started using this in outreach for those times like before it gets dark or if we have a, you know, a rainy, a rain out and we, we end up inside for something. And I've been surprised how much time I spend talking to people about this. Uh, we'll, I'll sit there and we'll look at one picture for like 10 or 15 minutes and a group of people talk about it occasionally. And it's been really fun. So I wanted to share with everybody and have a conversation, see. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about something or know more than I do, which is quite likely uh, about the objects, please uh, feel free to raise your hand or put it in chat. I have the microphone here to, to walk around. Um, so, yeah. So we'll start with the biggest, brightest thing that we have in the night sky, uh, the sun. So I took this. I can't remember when. This was pretty recent, I think, in the last couple months, a mosaic uh, through my Dobsonian, so not on any kind of fancy mount. Uh, it was with an astronomy camera, but uh, not any of the fancy astronomy features turned on like cooling. Um, so it was really neat to, to see. It was very active. You can see a bunch of sunspots, and you could see those through the eyepiece with, a, with the proper filter. Please, 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 please use the right filters or you will go blind literally burn your eyes. Um, I had a white light filter, so it's a mesh that blocks all but 0.0001% of light or something crazy. Okay, so keeps about 10, one ten thousandth of the light coming through it. Um, and with that in your eyepiece, you can view the sun. Um, okay, while we're on safety, uh, one thing to do if you do this, take your finder scope off of your scope use the shadow of your scope to line up with the sun. Do not look through any optics without a filter. It's very dangerous. Um, I've not done this, but I've heard if you hold a piece of paper up without filter, you will catch the paper on fire. Uh, the light coming through an eyepiece. I had no filters on this one. The question was, was if it was yellow. Um, I'm sure that in the processing, I just gave it a yellow hue as I, you know, whatever looked good to me at the time. I've got an Astros app filter. If you don't set the settings on the counter right, it'll turn all the sunspots red. Interesting. All right. Any comments on sun? Okay. Thanks, Naveen. Um, just to, um, and what you said with respect to safety and everything uh years ago uh one of our club members current club members um what's steve's last name is the um no steve goodman yeah steve um would uh would put a uh a film an old an old film canister on the eyepiece hmm. and he would take the solar filter off of the uh off the front of the scope 
and it would literally burn a hole in the in the canister like oh. within about a couple of milliseconds so that's why you never want to like you said either don't either filter your finder scope or take it off which is really the safest thing to do and um you know because and literally um check your solar filter before you ever put it even put it on the scope because you don't want it just be irreparable damage to your eye yeah thank you Doug. not all doom and gloom it is very cool if you have the right filters to, to look at the sunspots so. all right um oh that was my <laughs> oh that's interesting why is that not uh showing up Take the solar filter sun pictures during church on Sunday morning. And then I'll bring the sun into the church. Okay, so the next object, of course, well, not of course, but what I've had in the slides. So we have the moon. This one I, I took when I was still just starting out. I had my DSLR, my wife's DSLR, on um, a short tripod in the driveway, overexposed, had no idea what I was doing. Um, and this is when I learned about Earthshine. Uh, so the, the back side of the moon, the dark side is not really dark. You can actually see light from the Earth, the light reflected off the Earth back onto the moon and then reflected back to us. Um, interestingly, like I hadn't realized it until this last Sunday, we were at Three Bears. So like you, There are times when you can actually see it naked eye too. Um, so we were able to see it uh, when it was a, a pretty thin crescent setting. Uh, before the sun had completely set and then look at it through the telescope which is was pretty cool um i think it's probably my favorite lunar picture and i think it's the first one i ever ever took and then no idea what i was doing but still love it and this is the picture that doug uh, took of Venus, uh, transit of Venus in front of the sun. So another case where that solar filter is critical. Um, it will burn cameras just as fast. It will burn your eye. But uh, these are interesting events where you can get some of the inner planets as they pass between the sun and the Earth. Um, someday I'd like to get something like this. It's a really cool one. Uh, Venus right now, if, if you're not aware, like you can see it, it's super bright in the night sky uh, at about sundown. Um, you'll see, uh, you can't miss it. It's like the first star-like thing you see. It's, it's really bright. And if you look at it through um, telescope or perhaps even binoculars, uh, you can see that it's, uh, because it's not, like if we see Venus when it's full, like that means we can see through the sun because that's when all like the full surface facing us would be reflecting light. So we always see only part of the surface. Um, and right now it's a little bit larger than half uh, of the of the planet. Uh, as the sun gets down, goes down though, it gets pretty bright. So be aware of that. Slightly blinding at some point. I'm just gonna pause for comments. People wanna raise your hand if you have questions. Or I'll move on. Yes, Frank. If I had this toy in 2012 on top of the Moorhead Planetarium, I could have had one bonanza of a field day. But all I had back then was a smaller L18 handheld behind some binoculars and right. some of the telescopes, too. All right. Thank you. Which I did right. still bring home some pretty good. All right, next we have planet or other planets. Um, I have not done much planetary imaging. This is what I've gotten with the uh, Dobsonian. I think for this particular image, I, I did a crazy project where I took the Dob off of its static mount and then put it on my equatorial mount. Um, so I had this humongous telescope on an equatorial mount that was not designed for it. It was, it was fun. Um, but the neat thing about this, like everything I've done planetary is kind of accidental, especially with Jupiter. I have another one that's got the red spot, but this is Ganymede casting a shadow onto the surface of the planet Jupiter. And then there's two other moons on the, the edges. I, I, I don't remember the names of them, but uh, 
a lot of people in doing planetary imaging will, will go after events like this. And I, there was a really neat one I saw, um, can't remember where, but it was the eclipse, one, one moon um, eclipsing another. So you could see this uh, uh, over a time lapse, you could see the shadow going across the second moon from, from what the other one it was. It's fascinating. Like, there's a whole world of stuff that happens that I, I had never really thought about. But, uh, I don't really have the right gear for doing this. And we don't have really great skies here in North Carolina. But if I had the gear, I'd give it a shot. Why not, right? Um, be a new challenge. And then my similar setup with the Dobsonian, this one had to have been on the mount um, with the with uh, getting a Saturn. Um, I hadn't expected to see a whole lot, but you can see like separation in the rings and different colors, the banding on the planet, which is kind of cool. Can you make out the hexagon? Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so there's like a hexagon at the, the top. Uh, I don't remember. I think they might have figured out why it was forming. I'm not sure. What camera was I using? Uh, this was the ASI 533MC Pro um, with a very small region of interest because that's a big sensor. Yes, Dana? And what telescope? What telescope? This was my eight inch job on my, I, I had mounted it on the equatorial mount at this one. So this, I have done, it's an interesting experiment. If you have a, if you can do a, a region of interest, so you don't take the whole sensor, which means you can get more frames. Um, orient the can if you have like even a static telescope, like a Dobsonian. Uh, I first started out just orienting the camera so that the planet would move horizontally across the frame and do a very wide region of interest. And you take video for, for planetary imaging, um, that's all. That's a whole nother talk on how to process that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't think we want to get into that here, but um, it can be done with uh, pretty simple equipment. All right, and we'll wait for it to load. Come on. All right. So this is a time lapse of Ceres dwarf planet. I uh, did a wide field. Okay, well, that was weird. Um, <laughs> I did, a, this was with a 135 millimeter camera lens and a DSLR. And I was taking two minute exposure. So every frame is, you know, two minutes. Um, and I believe Whirlpool was somewhere else in the, the field. So it was one of those, I'll get Whirlpool Galaxy, which at that focal length is pretty small. Uh, but then also this. Uh, so dwarf planet, but the neat thing was I didn't know there was an asteroid in the field too. And if you look in the middle right here, you can see it, um, Chloris. Um, I was processing the data. I'm like, what's this weird streak over here in this other area? And I started looking into it and figured out how to find what it was, which was a chore. Um, and it's one, it's a bright asteroid. It's not like anything dim and fancy it's it's one of the brighter ones so those are two other objects out there in our solar system dwarf dwarf planets and asteroids yeah. i don't do dim image no. oh wait that's a lie um another one for solar system is cometary comets so this is the one the green comet that came through earlier this year it's got a great name if i can remember it now uh oh it's in the corner good i can cheat uh, C twenty twenty two E three ZTF, um, and this was from my backyard. They're really a, a, a bear to process. Uh, but when I took this one, I, what I didn't realize, I knew there were two tails. There's a dust tail and an ion tail. So the dust tail is from um, solar radiation pushing material away from the comet, away from the sun. And the ion tail is from solar wind, so it's moving super fast. So you can draw a line through the ion tail, which is the long one here. You can draw a line for, through this straight to the sun because of how fast it's moving. And the other tail is an anti-tail. 
And I either keep forgetting what it is from, or uh, I don't think I've looked it up again, but I believe it has to do with it. But this is when the comet was moving away from the sun. So it's got three tails in this particular one. Did anybody get to see the comet through uh, binoculars or telescope or whatnot? Yeah, I did. We got some people here. Anybody try and wasn't able to? No, it was pretty dim, but not too bad. I was able to see it in my backyard, drug the kids out. They're like, oh, come on. What are you doing, Dad? Um, it was it was a very, very faint smudge. Uh, they, they, they don't call them faint fuzzies for nothing. And it was it was faint and fuzzy, but it definitely wasn't a star. And it was there. I, my my backyard's about Bortle six. Um, so. All right. So on to stars. So I have I haven't been reading out the descriptions at the bottom. Hopefully everybody has noticed those. But um, this one is the, the beehive cluster. Uh, beehive cluster Messier 44 is uh, visible right now at sundown um, somewhere near Gemini. I don't know my sky very well. I'm still learning. Um, so it'll be in the western sky. And it's large. It's very large. Get a pair of binoculars very easily be able to, to make it out. It's a cluster of bright stars. It's not as easy to make out as like Pleiades, um, Seven Sisters, but it's, it's still quite visible. And then near it, I'm just trying to think like right now as it's setting, if you go down and to the left, there's another tighter, smaller um, star cluster. Uh, doesn't have a nice common name. I can't remember what it is, but All right, and then other structures. Uh, this one, uh, hard to make out, I'll use the cursor. This is uh, Orion, so constellations. Uh, so constellations, there's uh, patterns, recognizable patterns that um, uh, we have you know, subscribe to the sky, and also they're used to, to carve up the sky into 86 chunks, is it 87, 80, 88, 88. okay. Um, this one was, uh, so you can see there's the shoulders, so that's Betelgeuse and other stars, I don't remember the names of, <laughs> the belt here, which is very interesting here, you've got the flame nebula and um, horse head, and then, of course, the, the Great Orion Nebula and the Running Man and the Sword. And then other structures in the night sky, asterisms. So these are structures that you give a name to that aren't constellations. Uh, things like uh, Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, um, the Big Dipper. It's not a constellation. It is an asterism. It's part of a, the Ursa Major. Um, so if you, you get to a little bit darker skies, there's a, there's more to it, you know, head of the bear and the legs and all that. So. Some of these may look like they're overexposed. However, it might actually look like that if you could hop in a spaceship and travel all the way to that, it might be that bright. Well, this, the main stars in this cluster are very, very bright. Um, and they make it hard to get the dust, which I, I enjoy dusty pictures a little bit. Uh, though this one I think is probably my favorite picture still. So this is uh, uh, two open clusters uh, called double cluster. Um, and they're right off of Cassiopeia. Once you know where they are, they're pretty easy to find. You can see them in a pair of binoculars. I've got some eight by 50 binoculars, I think. Maybe they're 10 by 50, um, but very cool to, to, to view. Um, I got this last fall and I still have it as like my lock screen and stuff on my phone. I haven't, I usually like whatever my favorite is, I'll swap it out. These have, these have kept that spot for quite a while now. Other groupings of stars. So these, so glob, um, open clusters are within the Milky Way. So they're 
they're structures, you know, stars that have been in a star forming region and they're, you know, the star forming has ended and they're slowly dispersing. They're slowly going apart from each other. Globular clusters, on the other hand, are um, all, if not maybe, maybe, there may be an exception. I need to look this up, but there's there are large masses of stars, 100,000, 500,000 stars that are gravitationally bound. They're old stars and they're orbiting the Milky Way. So they're outside of the main body of the Milky Way. Uh, there was a talk in the Astronomy Club within the last half year uh, that covered a little bit of this. It was a fascinating thing I learned about it. Like as they're moving around the Milky Way, they're, they're losing material. So they're slowly shedding mass as they move. Um, which is interesting. So uh, these are, uh, I wouldn't say they're hard to find. They're smaller than an open cluster. They're more compact. Um, you certainly can find them. There's several out right, right now. Um, so on Sunday, uh, for the first time I saw with my eight inch dob, it was uh, M3, M13, and another one I can't remember is an NGC one, but uh, pretty cool to, to, to look at. And if you're looking at them, you use what we, you know, averted vision to look, use your peripheral vision, and you can see a little bit more structure in the center of these and other types of objects, uh, galaxies. All right. So galaxies or milky circle, as the Greeks called them. Um, these are collections of many, 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 many stars <laughs> um, outside of our, our galaxy, which is the Milky Way. And uh, that's where the term, I guess, comes from, from late Latin is the Milky Way. Galaxy. And this particular image is the Triangulum Galaxy. What I find really interesting with some of these, you, you can mix um, different filters for taking pictures. And you see all these, these reddish areas in, in the, the galaxy. Those are nebula in that galaxy, uh, many millions of light years away. Uh, so when we take a picture of something like the Orion Nebula, you know, some other civilization in another galaxy may be looking in at our Orion Nebula and seeing these little blobs. So, Anna. Via Lactea is the Milky Road. Okay, and, and that was in what Latin? Classic? <laughs> Classical Latin. Sorry, trying to repeat for the Zoom. Cool. And there's different types of, oh, okay, well, before we get into types of galaxies, um, one of the things you can, can view also is uh, clusters. So there's groupings of, of galaxies. Um, uh, there's a whole hierarchy of them. So there's a local group. And if my memory is, is failing me on all those, anybody comment on, on different structures of galaxies and like there's strings of them. Filaments of galaxies, super clusters. Okay. Um, so, yeah, our galaxy is part of the local group, the Andromeda Galaxy and Triangulum, which was on the previous slide. Um, they're part of our local group. This is uh, part of the Markarians chain, or maybe it is the Markarians chain in the Virgo cluster. All right. So different types of galaxies. So not all of them look nice and spirally and pretty. Um, there's an example here off of Andromeda. Um, this is the best elliptical one that I have, but they've been perturbed or disturbed by other forces. So Andromeda captured this other smaller galaxy and messed it up. So like all of the stars that probably were in a nice structure before around a, a, a black hole core, are now just kind of blended together went into a, a blob, not even a sphere, just kind of a blob. Uh, we have spiral galaxies. So this one's pretty popular right now. If you haven't heard, there's a supernova that went off in a pinwheel galaxy. Um, I believe it's about right here. I have not seen it. I have not seen pinwheel through an eyepiece yet. I tried it on Sunday and just I just couldn't see it. Um, 
but these are really interesting. Uh, our our galaxy is a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, there's different flavors of of spirals. We have also um, uh, barred uh, spirals, and there's a whole dichotomy of, of different things that I I don't have all the pictures for. And I know there's other other presentations that have gone into these in a lot more detail. But uh, we know the Milky Way but by analyzing uh, what we can see, which is only a slice, because we're looking through the dust. We can't see the entire structure. We we know it's a barred spiral galaxy, so we have a a bar down the middle. And then the spiral arms coming off of that. Uh, fun fact with this particular picture, hard to probably make out here. And I've got another version of it. There are, I think, 177 quasars and 144 small galaxies. I went through, I, I used a catalog to, to find them, but then I went through and verified every single one of them is actually shown in the data. So that was a fun, fun project that took a couple of days. <laughs> um, oh, Dana, yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> right, name them all. I think I did one of the chats. Say this is down in the bottom right, that's pretty nice. Oh, the, this little guy down yeah, here? Guy. Yeah. Well, this, this field in particular, I really like because there's so many galaxies and not just the really tiny ones that look like little specks, but if you look around, there's there's little structures there. I think this is a galaxy up here. Anything that looks a little fuzzy, of course, there's stuff behind the, the letters, but yeah, this one did turn out, turn out nice in the corner too. It's got an interesting structure. It looks like a, you know, the core is off to the side. So I don't know. I wonder what's happened with that one. I haven't looked it up. Doug. It's probably interacting with oh, it's interacting the, with it. Okay. It isn't like it's being pulled out. Yeah. I think your next one's going to be a really uh, interesting one that we're interacting with galaxies as well. But yeah. That M82 one. Uh, cigar, it's at M82, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, irregular galaxies. Um, so this one is usually you hear a, a Bode's and Cigar. So there's a M81, it's Bode's, a Bode's Galaxy, which is a um, spiral, and then uh, a Cigar Galaxy, M82, this one, uh, Irregular Galaxy. I did um, narrow band image with this one. So the, the filaments coming out of the core. Yeah, there's jets coming out. What's interesting, there's like a life cycle to it. It jets out, and I can't, I didn't capture it in this, but it cycles back around in parts of it, at least cycle back into the galaxy, is what I've read. So, pretty fascinating. Uh, yes, sir. It's actually interacting with Bose, and then there's another uh, NGC galaxy up above. They're all interacting. And so, uh, literally, uh, it's Bose is actually what's kind of warping that galaxy. Um, and okay. Uh, you can even see it in your photo. It's actually split in the middle. The galaxy is literally one piece of it trying to go away, and the other piece is coming from the center. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. I can. You want to repeat, or you want me to try and paraphrase? Paraphrase. Yeah. It was on. So, so just to point out that that there is an NGC galaxy not not in frame, and then Bode's is not in frame. Um, they're interacting to pull this galaxy apart. So you have one part of the galaxy that's being pulled towards Bode's, the other one is trying to pull away. Um, and you can even see it kind of in the center there, where you've got those those jets coming out uh, from that central pulsar. There's a uh, a split. It's literally being pulled apart. So it's always um, it's really interesting that. <clears throat> Uh, one of the uh, Duke professors uh, in astrophysics um, actually has a slide where they show the gases that are actually interacting with these those three galaxies. So it's it's a really one of my favorite ones to look at. I guess that's why, <laughs> but it's I think it's really cool that you kind of see this, and it's happening over light years of of distance. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible the way that that the the interaction is is happening there. A question on Facebook. Thanks. 
R equals quasar light beam. R equals quasar light beam. Question mark. So what does a bar in a galaxy mean? By the way, you can unmute on Zoom and ask your question if as long as it's Facebook. Oh, never mind. You can't do that. Okay, I missed. So, because we talked about a couple of different things, ask asking if it's a quite large. So no, it's not a. It's it, well. So the red in that is gas being ejected. Um, Doug mentioned it's a pulsar. It, that I I think it I think I'd read it was a a black hole. Um, it's not a quasar. Quasar used to be a registered trademark of Motorola. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I I don't know the answer. To that. <laughs> All right. Now into nebula. Um, so there's a bunch of different kinds of nebula. As I said at the beginning, this is what got me creating this presentation. Um, so it's a, from Latin, fog, cloud, or vapor. If you see a nebula through a telescope, which you can, um, I know for uh, Great Orion Nebula is really, really bright. So if you look at the sort of Orion, the middle star, it's actually a small star cluster. And into the side, you'll see like a blue, almost wings. That's part of the, of the Orion Nebula. Um, there's others you can view, even naked eye, if you get to really dark places, such as the Lagoon Nebula. Um, a lot of the, the Messier objects, uh, which is a catalog uh, of very bright uh, uh, deep sky objects. Um, which most, a lot of them are, are, are star clusters but, and, and galaxies, but there are some nebula in it. <clears throat> um, so there's dark nebula, dark nebula, planetary nebula, which have nothing to do with planets, supernova remnants, emission nebula, reflection nebula, and my favorite, integrated flux nebula. Um, this one is a, a false palette uh, picture of the California nebula. And uh, you did that. Hmm? And you did that. I made the nebula, yes. Dana, no. <laughs> um, so dark dark nebula are interesting. Um, they are basically dust in space blocking sunlight or starlight. So if you see in this picture, there's a couple of dark blotchy places. Well, there's stars behind it. We just can't see it because of the, the dust that's blocking it. Um, I don't, can, I guess you could see them through a telescope through the absence of stars, maybe. I don't know. I haven't tried. Uh, then you've got their supernova remnants. Um, Crab Nebula is an example of a supernova remnant that you can see. Through a telescope, I've, I've seen it through a short refractor at, at Big Woods, actually, uh, which was really neat. Uh, this one is the part of the Veil Nebula. It's actually a little bigger. It goes off the screen, unfortunately. Um, this one is, I, I, I don't know how fast the other, you know, if it's a typical speed, but what I've read is the gases from this remnant are expanding at, uh, I believe it's a million miles per hour. So oh, they're they're booking. Uh, planetary nebula, so forms when a red giant is um, late in its life, and it will blow off gas and collapse into, I believe, a white dwarf. So again, one of those things that I need to look up. So if you look into the middle of this one, unfortunately, it doesn't have a great name. Abel thirty nine. Um, you can see the planetary, the, the remnant, the star that was left behind. And they're called planetary nebula. Does anybody know why? Doug, you know? 
You, did you have the microphone? <laughs> Dana. Just. The reason why they're called uh, planetary nebulas is, is that when Herschel first looked, started looking at these objects, um, they he was able to see that there was a central star in there, and he he thought that it was the beginning of a new um, of a new solar system, and that the central that was a central star, and the ring around it would could possibly hold planets. So, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's actually turned out to be quite the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as I understand it, it was actually. It was actually Herschel that that actually um, coined that name. Okay, Herschel. Okay, I had heard, and uh, maybe I guess I'm I'm wrong. I'd heard that it was because of the shape and the size relative to Jupiter. They were thought to maybe be some something like a planet. But cool. Um, you can see planetary nebula through the telescope right now, actually. Um, the Ring Nebula is up, or well, maybe not right at sundown, but it's up uh, Lyra, I believe, near the star Vega, which is really bright, which makes it easy to find. Um, saw it for the first time on, on Sunday, which is really neat. It's interesting, you look at the Ring Nebula specifically, at least, look at it, it looks like a flat disk, but if you give, you know, have look away, averted bit vision, I, I thought it was like if you took the color out of a, a red blood cell, it's kind of the structure, it's kind of dips off in brightness in the middle. Very interesting. All right, emission nebula. So when you see pictures of pretty nebula that um, from various big telescopes or amateur astronomers, whatnot, it's typically an emission nebula. So it's uh, ionized gas emitting light at various wavelengths. Uh, hydrogen alpha is the one that's the most abundant, and that's what the red in this one is for the Lagoon Nebula. Uh, it's very red, so one of the other uh, emission lines is sulfur-2, which is slightly redder. They're red enough we can't see them. Uh, most, most DSLRs can't see them very well either. Um, my The first DSLR I tried using, uh, I pointed it at uh, the Rosette Nebula and was disappointed because I could just see a little bit of the red, but not much. So then I went looking for astronomy cameras. Like I need to see more. Um, and then the third common emission line is oxygen three, which in the top here you can see there's another structure. This is the uh, Trifid Nebula, and that that teal up here is the oxygen three. So oxygen three and, and hydrogen alpha are the two common ones. Sulfur two sometimes we'll use, but not as often. All right, reflection nebula. These ones are interesting. So a uh, star passes near some dust, that star has color. It's going to bounce that light off the dust. So what we see here is the iris nebula, which is nestled in this dust over here, it's a blue star. And the light of that star is bouncing off the dust. Um, Pleiades is another great example. So the Seven Sisters, very bright, open cluster. Uh, they're passing through some interstellar dust right now and lighting it up blue. So a, lot of, a lot of good examples. Of that. And then another one of Iris, wider field, uh, with a, my uh, camera lens, uh, but this is integrated flux nebula. This one I found fascinating because it's not it's not being lit up by any particular star. It's the integrated light from the entire galaxy lighting up the dust. Um, so that's kind of why I like dusty stuff because it just blows my mind still that that <laughs> that's a thing, and it's hard to. To, to do uh, well. This one happened to be a really pretty fast camera lens, so made it easier to get the picture. But, um, and some structures have a lot of things going on. So this one is the, it's a mouthful, the Rho Ophiuchi Cloud Complex. Um, so there's a, there's reflection nebula, so the red part, no, not red, sorry. Reflection is the blue. Blue and the yellow are reflection nebulae. 
We've got dark nebulous streamers. If I had more panels, they would be streaming off to the side, apparently. Um, that's on my bucket list to get more of this. Um, there's the emission nebula, so the red over here on the side, and there's faint bits on the bottom of the frame. There's globular clusters. I think there were three, at least. There's one right here. There's one right here. And I think that one's also a globular cluster in the top. Um, and I happened to find there were a couple of asteroids that I have no idea where they are now, but uh, they're, <laughs> they just look like stars in this picture. But that was neat to find there, there's more stuff out there, as well as a whole bunch of stars. So this one's pretty close to the, um, the Milky Way, the, the core. So if you moved off down to the right and uh, bottom and uh, down and left, gosh, um, you'd be getting into a lot more of the Milky Way core. Yes. The globular clusters are outside of our galaxy Correct. orbiting. Where is the cloud complex in relation to the three globular clusters? In, it's it inside. In, it's a foreground object. Yeah. And so we can just happen to see the big globular cluster because there's a lane we can see through. Yes. So the the stars you see in the bottom here that's if you keep going that way that's the the core of the milky way so mm -hmm. so we're looking a little bit off mm -hmm. and out so that cloud complex is reasonably close to us it's got to be i don't know if it's in our arm or a nearby arm and then we're looking through that to see the globular clusters in the background mm -hmm. And I believe that might be my last slide. It is. All right. So, any questions, comments, things I should take a picture of that I haven't? Because I'll take the challenge. <laughs> yeah, I have had fun immersing you in some of your pictures using the glorious question mark double exposure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Mike. So uh, I was just going to ask, uh, could you like tell us a little bit about what you did to process this? These are amazing images. So uh, this that's, that's pretty incredible. Thank you. Um, so this one, I slept in the back of my car for two nights to get <laughs> out at Big Woods. Seriously, um, it was a Monday and Tuesday night. So I was a zombie by Thursday. Uh, I don't I don't think I processed it that week, but um, so the processing is two panels, about two and a half hours each. It's pretty low in the southern sky. And from my backyard, I could I have a like a 50 minute window to see it. So not great. We had uh, moonless, cloudless nights, two in a row at Big Woods. I'm like, I'm in. Um, processing wise, I use PixInsight for processing, though I have been using it's a pay, paid software. Um, I don't know that I can go much into any more details than that, but what the, the process is basically you're trying to remove noise, bring out the signal, enhance the colors through saturation, or if you're doing false color, you know, blending different filters or color channels in ways that look good to you. It's a very artistic process. Like, um, so every time I reprocess anything I've done, it always looks different. Always. I never get the same thing twice, which is really neat. Uh, generally, it's better. Sometimes not. Some of those I just throw away. But <laughs> um, there's, there's free software out there. And we have an imaging um, uh, group that is you know, very into all of this stuff, the free software and the paid software, if you have an interest in this. Um, it is not an easy thing to take on and learn, but this, as uh, Daniel was saying, like this is a support group, if you will, to, to help people on their journey, either visually or scientifically or you know, photography. Is that a word? Um, so, yeah. Anything else? Anything on Zoom or Facebook? No? Okay. Rob? 
How much would you see on an EAA setup? Well, it depends on your setup. This was a two panels um, with a 135 millimeter lens at F2. So if you had an EAA setup or electronically assisted astronomy, um, you could easily frame like the core part here and see it, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, it's a large object. Uh, so those who don't know, EAA is kind of a blending of visual and, and photography where you take short exposures and dynamically um, what we call integrate or stack them to remove noise, enhance the signal. But while you're, while you're having your telescope or whatever lens pointed at the sky, uh, so you can see it as it's coming in. I have not done EAA. So if anybody has and wants to <laughs> provide a better answer about what you would see, uh, it might be good. All right. Uh oh, am I going to be heckled? All I was going to say is an EAA, you won't see that. Yeah, I was gonna say, you're not gonna see any dust. No? I, I can I can get I can get a I can get dust, but I can't get that. You have a slider for saturation. <laughs> not that good a slider. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, you typically do it 50 a second. Yeah. You can go to 30. Yeah. Stand there waiting for because like, you're not guided. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. How do I stop? So that's the end of the presentation.